Those who have survived the unthinkable and unspeakable violence behind the closed doors of their own homes are speaking out now more than ever. This podcast is dedicated to sharing their stories and the journeys of people who've transformed their lives from surviving into thriving. Join me and my guests as we dive into what healing from trauma really looks like. Hear heartwarming and awe-inspiring stories of overcoming the odds. Welcome to the Flow Rising Podcast. The show contains adult topics and often triggering stories. Audience discretion is advised. Before we get started, please make sure you subscribe to the channel, then like and share your favorite videos. Thanks for the support. Hello, everyone, and welcome to this episode of Flow Rising. I am your host, Megan, and today I am joined by my guest, Lynn. We're going to chat all about business and the things that she's up to today, as we always do on the show. So first off, Lynn, thank you for joining me, and welcome to the show. Thank you so much, Megan. Excited to be here. Absolutely. So as always with all my guests, every show starts with share with the audience and myself what it is that you're up to today, the kinds of things you're bringing into the world, the kind of people that you serve, um, and just you know what's bringing you passion in the world right now. Yeah. So I'm a repeat founder. Um, I've launched a couple different startups and I've um, had this journey of healing that's uh, lasted many years. And um, as I've gone through that process, even within the last couple of years, there's been really um, dramatic healing for me and it's fueling what I'm doing now. And so I've taken the passion of launching businesses and turned that into helping um, early stage and aspiring startup founders and really stepping into the visibility as a person that I was so petrified of growing up because of my background. And during our session, I'm just super excited to encourage and I want to inspire our listeners in their own um, healing and their own entrepreneurial journey and um, invite everyone into my messy because it's a process of us um, coming around that where we can bring that forward. And I really am excited to share, for me, three, sec three secret weapons for finally getting to wholeness and um, what fuels my work now helping startup founders. Love that, yeah. Um, so it sounds to me, you know, like you are the behind the scenes human that helps these people kind of get off the ground. Like you said, the visibility piece. So if we talk in audio, we talk in video. I mean, there's so many things when we talk visibility. So share with us a little bit about what that actually means for the kinds of people that you serve right now. So having, um, I was in tech sales and I'm working with uh, enterprise companies and COVID hits and the whole way of reaching buyers changed. Like the buyer journey needed to change where people no longer wanted that salesy, schmolzy, you know, everything went remote. And it really became about drawing people in and using content. And so as I started talking about that with my audience, I joined an executive leadership group and coming around, you know, producing content and ge getting on camera. And as I walked into that and I started talking about the buyer journey and um, how to reach an audience, startup founders started reaching out to me. And as they did, I was finding that they were oftentimes um, not versed in marketing and sales, and they didn't realize that the buyer journey had changed. And so that really got me on the path of there's a, a group of folks that have a great idea, but they don't know how to get it to market. And so that um, showed me that there was an audience that I could help. And because I love so much, um, you know, taking something to market and um, that process, I was able to um, 
move that in a direction of, I'm not going to chase another corporate gig. Instead, I'm going to help other people. And I think it's kind of exciting now that the economy is such that, you know, hard to get jobs. People are like, what do I do now? And there's some things that I think really are creating opportunity that we've never had with AI and the uh, creator economy. And so it's, it's getting really exciting and fun to help other founders that maybe um, don't have the bandwidth, don't have the expertise, or maybe they don't want to get as much in the limelight. Um, so now I'm helping them and I would call it a founder led strategy. So it's getting to market on the cheap. Always good when you're starting a business to have that be an economic way uh, to get off the ground. Love that. Love that. So one of the things we really focus here on the show is, is the healing part and how that feeds because mm. all of my guests are some kind of an entrepreneur. Um, starting a business and the healing process seemingly yeah. go hand in hand. I think a lot of us yeah. who have come from backgrounds of childhood traumas or, mm -hmm. you know, like I share a lot on the show my own personal traumas in my previous marriage, we just find it really hard to sit at a nine to five. PTSD gets in the way. Triggers get in the way. You know, it, environments get in the way. So talk a little bit about how, you, like you've said, you've had a lot of startups, you've done a lot of entrepreneurial stuff, but share with us a little bit about how that healing part of what you were going through really kind of fueled you in you know, continuing to move forward with business because as we know, when we're healing, there's a lot of days when it's just like, oh my gosh, I can't show up. And maybe I have to have a client or things like that. So talk a little bit about that, how that healing piece really kind of, you know, pushed you into that entrepreneurial side of life. So for me, there were three big messages that I got from the abuse in my childhood. And it was, you're not like other kids. Um, you don't get to dream about a future like they do and go and fulfill it. And there, I, I struggled with a scarcity mindset. And so it was just take what comes along and you can't ever say no to anything because you might not get, you know, future opportunities. And so there were a lot of, choices that I made and the way that I navigated life for many years of, you know, desperation and survival mode and, and, um, and really living in hiding and, and living in scarcity. So I couldn't pick and choose in life, but I don't, there was something in me that, um, when I came across an opportunity. I was start, it was one of my times where I was starting over in life. And so I'm out eating what I kill in this sales rep role. And somebody comes into a sales meeting and they um, say, Hey, I've got this product. And there's like, you know, 10 of us reps and nine are like, this is so stupid. And I'm like, Oh my goodness, this is amazing. And, and I, I recognized an opportunity and there was something that I thought I can do this. And I had a, a customer that gave me a huge purchase order as I tried to start selling this product, even just in my territory without having it as a custom product. And, and that just told me like, I could do this. And so I put a business plan together. I spent six weeks doing it and I, um, I got a HELOC on my house and, um, I decided I was going to do it. And so in 2003, I formed my first company. Uh, and in 2014, I built and I launched a second company that was in corporate America. But it really was the, I want to finally be something and the proving piece. And I needed to... Um, I, I tried for many years, I tried everything to get to the, the root cause of what was fueling me or the decisions I was making. And it was, you know, chasing relationships and it was self-help books and it was um, Bible study and prayer and, and small groups and therapy and, 
you know, trying to be super fit. So, you know, I was six days a week, two hours a day in the gym and workaholism and, you know, looking to friends and drinking and just everything. And I really didn't, even though I was starting companies and I was doing business, there was still something that was still broken in me that I had to fe feel like I still had to hide. I still couldn't get out and be really courageous and able to dream the dream and go do it. And for me, that was in the last marriage that I was in, which was narcissistically abusive. And, and what I finally realized was the common denominator because I had been married three times and, and I, I, through all that trying, I could never get to the root. And it was when the worst thing that could, could have happened was getting in this final marriage, which was so destructive, but it was also the very best thing because it caused me to go face to face with codependency. And, and that was realizing that that was where now I can look it in the face and I can actually address it. And so I went through a, a, a group therapy and looking at, you know, working through trauma, abuse and recovery groups. And that was for me, the pivotal point where I was able to get free of that desperation of that, you know, living in shame. And that was the liberation for me to be able to really go and dream and do and, and, and be visible to start telling my story and realizing that I didn't have to feel less than my peers because of all of the years of screw ups. So that was really key for me. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's, that's a common theme that a lot of us who have come from abusive past have. though it's looking at ourselves and going, I'm the problem. I, I'm, I'm a problem. I'm, I'm wrong. I'm bad because like you said, you know, that, that, that that common denominator was always me. I mean, I stayed, I, I always tell people I stayed in one marriage for 18 years. I could have very easily been in two or three if I'd loved him earlier. I don't think that I would have at any point. I think we all get to this point, this catalytic point or moment where, um, you know, for me, I was, I was at a nine to five job and I'm screaming my head off at a coworker. And I was all of a sudden went, I have to change. Oh, what? I ha Oh, okay. Um, so, you know, it, it, it's just interesting to me how we kind of get that introspective look and go, oh, oh no, I, okay. As I travel this change path now, I can let go of this. I can let go of that. I can actually dive into what success look like for me. What's, you know, what's, what's it going to take for me? Like you said, to dream and to, to, to go after those kinds of dreams. Um, so how are some ways, I'm just curious, uh, self-help or not self-help, excuse me, self-care is something that comes up a lot in the show. And I know this is a newish, like you said, it's kind of 2020 sort of started this particular vein of your entrepreneurial journey. How has self-care played a, like a really big role in being able to continue to be an entrepreneur? Because I think a lot of my audience, that's what we, you know, we, we want to start this business, but then you start and then I go away and then I start and it's almost like you're repeating those bad relationship cycles. Mm -hmm. So what are some things you do personally to make sure that you, you stay forefront so you can be present and you can, you know, be there for your clients and for your business and that kind of stuff. So you've got the, you know, we're spirit, soul, and body. So we got to really be attending to all three of those. And so for me, um, I have to have my, my heart right. And, and so, you know, being in prayer and, um, being in truth. So renewing my mind every day of things that are true, because there's so many voices and things that are wrong 
And it's easy for us to get caught up in that. So I think, you know, having good spiritual hygiene, I guess. So I think that, you know, that's a daily um, fixture. And then, you know, there's the physical piece of it. And um, we can be, you know, I'm too busy and, um, and, and we can have expectations of doing something huge. And instead of um, what can I do that's sustainable? And so for me, I had to leave where I, I literally had to leave everything behind where I came from to get free of the triggers, the constantly looking over my shoulder with this person that's living in my community. And I came to the desert and the process that I went through for healing that I could get my mind right and get my focus ahead where I'm no longer in survival mode was I would go march around the desert every single morning and I live on the edge of the foothills. And so it's literally the desert and I would get out there and I, you know, would pray and hash this stuff out, you know, all of the feelings and, and, you know, even the, you know, I'm angry at God and I'm, I'm working my way through it, but I'm getting it out. And, and so I was, you know, spiritually working through things while I was out walking, but the walking piece was something that I knew that every single day I could get out and I could do it. And I'm not having to, you know, drive to a gym, drive home, you know, like we can find so many excuses. And I love like atomic habits where we can create an environment to make it so much easier to do the thing. And we put away the distractions, you know, hide the remote, whatever. (laughs) And so um, for me, the walking became this cathartic thing that I could do and sustain. And so that was for me what I've done. Um, And I'm still kind of in a transition, but for now, and, and, and then there's the mental. And I think um, for me, I've, I've gotten in community with some other executives. um, And that's part of what, as I help, you know, startup founders get to market And as we go to market, and I mentioned about how the buyer journey has changed so much that for every single person, regardless of how they're trying to reach a buyer, um, content and social media and that, that way that people find us and they get to know us and they build trust in us, it's, um, around, um, putting ourselves out there and, and doing community with people, whether it's our buyer, whether it's our peers and with, um, other professionals that we can support each other and, um, um, encourage one another and we can learn from one another. So those are, um, at a high level, some highlights of how, you know, that spirit, soul, body, what's been important for me. Yeah. It's, it's interesting how many of my guests talk about getting out in nature and I do the same thing. Um, that it's just it, it, like you said, I mean, there are some days when I'm like, I cannot leave my house, but I have a beautiful backyard and I will literally just go walk laps. Around. It's not super huge, but it's big enough. I can actually move in it. And I will just put my feet on that ground and just get out and just that, that movement piece. It really is you know, and, and communing with nature, you know, yeah. I always tell people how, however you commune with spirit or God or whatever your term is, cause we all, it's that, that bigger than us, that spirituality piece that is so key. And I love how you're talking about, you know, putting those together. Like it's, it really is this melding of, oh, okay, I'm moving my body and I'm in my body and I'm with my spirit. And, and that is super huge for for finding that peace. Cause I think one of the things I know you help, like you said, you help your clients get visible and you help them. But I think a lot of us um, who come from backgrounds like us struggle with, you know, like you said, you physically moved away from a community. I am not so far away from mine, but not in the same town anymore as mine. Same reason. It's like, I don't feel safe. 
Yeah. I don't, I don't, and I, and I think it started for me anyway, it started with trusting myself, like this, you know, being able to do what we're doing right here. Right. So challenging when I first started. Yeah. So, I mean, and I took yeah. so many iterations of it and now I'm like, oh, this is, this is so comfortable. But, and I think that, you know, you can, you can talk a little bit about that, just how that trust in yourself really fuels being able to be visible and, and being able to go, no, I can speak my truth, business truth, personal truth, past truth. Yeah. Um, but you know, how is, how is that kind of trust factor for yourself? Um, play into that for for you personally so I was not able to let me back up my ability to really trust myself came in the finally finding my worth so for me as you said you stayed in one long marriage and I was a repeat offender. <laughs> and it was this constant, I'm chasing after being loved and I'm desperate for it. And, um, and each time was, was more and more hurt. And it was all because I, that destructive abuse as a child, you know, put in me that I'm not worthy. I don't have value. I don't have something to bring to the table. Other people have um, cracked the code and I'm a step behind. And I couldn't, I didn't find my worth until I mentioned those secret weapons for me. So it was, first of all, it was, even though I tried everything, I could not see codependency. I had no idea what that was until I was in my third marriage and I'm in this narcissistically abusive scenario and I get into this therapy group for abuse and, and trauma. And I finally learned what that word was. And, and it was like, Oh my goodness, I'm a codependent. And that in and of itself becomes such a shameful thing. Like, oh, I'm codependent. But what I found is that as I named that, that in and of itself is, is powerful when we will look it right in the eye. So that was step number one for me in, in being able to get to the wholeness. Number two was I had to forgive completely and cut it off. Like I'm handing over the visual is I trust that God is the great, um, leveler. Like he may, everything will be just in the end. And so I, in my faith, hand it over like a title deed of that offense for everything. And so as I went through that exchange, there was something, Megan, that was miraculous and supernatural where I was completely free. And, and then the third thing was refusing shame, like not just, okay, I'm not going to feel shame, but literally starting to speak and, and, you know, then going on in the dating process or whatnot, when you're telling your story it's being able to hold our head high and say, this is the thing that happened. And because it was no longer a wound, that it just is. And so I could now talk about it. And what I found was that is where the power lies. Mm -hmm. It is so powerful when we will refuse the shame and we will talk about it and we'll share it with our audience and we'll be outward. And that's where I was able to now look at other people in the eye. I was able to um, realize I, I deserve a place at the table. Yeah. 
And that was the transformation for me to start doing this and getting on camera and, and going back to the community thing, I found groups that have helped me and mentors that have helped me. And I've had to be gracious because it's a little bit of a process. And so my kind of being where I am to really having my voice, it took a lot of turning over rocks and connecting dots. And we do that and it's iterative. Like we're doing that conversation in our head every day where we're processing and we're like, where is my place? But when we know we have a place, we deserve a seat. And then we start to kind of explore and uh, give our inner voice um, a stage. And then it's shocking how that starts to take shape. Yeah. Super powerful stuff. Super powerful. And really, I love, I love how you just kind of like looked at that and you're like, oh, like, you know, I, it's funny. I don't know why we all have threes. I've had other guests that have three things too. Mine is awareness, choice, and change, right? Just like you, it's these three. I had to become aware. Like you said, I had to name it. And there is, I loved when you said that, like naming, I'm codependent. Oh, I'm codependent. Oh. And just, but then just see, feeling like that, that powerful piece going, okay, but I don't have to stay that way. Like there was, and, and I'm sure that's kind of what I get you were saying was like, you realized, oh, I, I chose to be that. Yes. There was all these things, all this programming, but ooh, how powerful that I get to actually I get to choose to be different. Yeah. I get to choose, right. You know, I get to choose who Lynn actually is. I get to redefine Lynn and this new human. And, and the uh, other piece is that happening? forgiveness, because if we don't do that, then we go on and we are the victim. Yeah. 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 Like some, there has to be some reconciliation for the wrong done to us. And if we can't exact it, but if we know that the God of the universe will, yep. it's kind of like, okay, here you go. And then we can move on, right? Yeah, that's that, that forgiveness, you know, and I, I've said this before and a lot of people say, okay, I'm forgiving you. That doesn't mean I condone what you did to me. What you did was wrong. Right. You nope. are a bad human. I yep. have bad bits. I have toxic traits. I'm codependent. I'm, you know, owning my own toxicity. But there's a difference. I always say that our narcissists are two, we're, we're opposite sides of the same coin. They choose, they actually choose to stay in the abuse. They choose to stay the victim. They choose to push the blame where we look at it and go, I accept my personal responsibility for how I showed up in that. And here's the beautiful thing. And yeah. I always do this. I go, sometimes I talk to lately. It's been my 20 year old self. That's when I got in my relationship. I'm like, you know what? I forgive you for making that choice. You made the best choice you could at the time. You were just looking for love. And I'm right. sorry that you didn't see you were worth it. And yeah. I forgive you. I forgive him. I forgive yeah. my mother. But yeah. that's, and there is that, that powerful piece of going, oh, I just don't have to hold that anymore. Like that weight. Um, yeah, that's, that's a beautiful, that is, a, that's a very beautiful feeling to just, oh, <laughs> I don't have to hold this weight anymore um, inside of me. Cause yeah. And it, it, I'm sure that you, even though, as you traverse these journeys, that it is, we get to this hole and we get to this healing. And, um, but one of the, my kind of newer things that I, I, again, openly share as much as you want, but what do you do for yourself when younger Lynn, or maybe your, your father or somebody, what is some of that internal talk because I think this is the part we don't talk about enough is that it still happens but we just have these new tools to work with it how do you on mornings when you're like oh there there it is again what's some of the things that you do to help yourself get back to this present moment are you asking if I get triggered back to the way that I was, the way I thought, the feelings I used to have or? Yeah, because stuff comes up like, oh, hey, I'm going to step into this new journey, for example, start a new business, right? And then all of a sudden, all these fears and anxiety. But then we go, wait, 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 I've overcome some of this. And there's that changing moment where it's like, so 
I guess what I'm asking is what's some of the, the switch talk that you do when, when that shows up, that little voice shows up that says, no, no, we really can't do this. And, you know, what do you do affirmations? I know you talked a lot about prayer or just yeah. what are some of the things that you personally do to go, no, I, I can, I can push through that even though it's sometimes still there. Cause it, I don't think it ever really fully goes away, but we just learn how to work with it and incorporate it. Megan, I feel so complete because of the steps that I've taken. I am such a healed person. And so I live every day from a place of wholeness that I've never experienced before. And so unless some crazy circumstance comes about that's, you know, really um, trips me up, I really don't find myself going back there in my, in my head and in my emotions. And because I feel like I know that I've been, um, I, I, I renew my mind every day on what's true as I read the scriptures. And so in doing those things, I have, few instances where I kind of get tripped up emotionally. And when I do, if I do, it's, you know, really coming back to, as you said, the having the conversation in my head about my new identity. It's, it's reminding ourselves. And, and I think it's good for us to kind of have a, a manifesto about ourselves where, you know, in the day of adverse adversity, here's what I know to be true. And we just go back to that. Or, you know, there's the people in our life that really we know are in our camp. And, you know, gosh, I remember, you know, going through some of my darkest days in life, I would call my mom and I'd be like, mom, I just need to hear that you love me, you know, and that that's okay to go to the people that know who we are. And, you know, like Brene Brown, who talks about, you know, she really talks about the the man in the arena and says, you know, if your phone number, you know, I don't know your phone number by heart, then, and, and, or, you know, you're not on my speed dial then you don't deserve to speak into my life. And so that small audience of people that we know love us and care for us, you know, it's okay to go to that um, little fan club yeah. and, you know, Hey, I'm, I'm struggling. And, you know, can I have a pep talk as well? Yeah, no, that's, and that was exactly what I, that, that question is people are always like, uh, but that doesn't happen. But that's the point is that having that, Exactly. Like we can, we get to ask for help. We get our needs met and we can't always, it's not about isolating. You talk a lot about community and I love that, that you're talking about tapping into a professional community, a personal community. Um, yeah. Love Brene Brown. And isn't but that, that hard? Isn't that hard though? Because we come from, at least I have, because it's been repeated betrayals and repeated abusers that it's like, we can so go in our head, like, I can't trust anybody. Yep. And then, and then we won't open up. We won't be vulnerable. And, yep. and I think it's just so important for us to do the work because then we start to be discerning, right? Mm-hmm. We, mm-hmm. when we do the work, now we can recognize who is safe, who isn't safe. And the people that we recognize that are, and we, and we learn to be very incremental as we're bringing people into our life. Like anybody that's gone through therapy, you've got the wheel and you've got like layers of trust. And for us that have been abused, that maybe got into a relationship that turned out to be a train wreck that, you know, instead of going through the layers, we went from, you know, zero to a 10. And now these people have complete access to us. And they, and they destroy us, but as we heal and we grow, then we start like being incremental, you know, you're a, a acquaintance and then you're Mm -hmm. a a more familiar acquaintance. And then, you know, working our way all the way to, they really are worthy of our trust and they are somebody that we can go to in the day of trouble. Yeah. 
No, that's that was beautifully put. Beautifully put. That it's just it's this. It's it is. It's that you know you you talked about the manifesto. We're rewriting that story. That okay. First off, I trust at the core this person. I I trust me. I trust my decisions. I oh yeah. And I used to do it with little tiny things, but now I get to do it with bigger things. Oh nope. I tr- I trust that I can get out of bed today. That used to be a big one for me. Oh. Oh, look, I got out of bed today. And it seems so small, but at the time that was that building, that rebuilding of I trust me. And then oh I reached, you know, and now I'm I'm in a, a new marriage and trusting him was <laughs> and luckily he's just this solid human being that's just like, ah, this is trauma showing up again, honey. Let's talk about it. Let's, let's be you don't you be as open as you want and you can tell me, you know, and and him re showing me. Oh, nope. You, yep, yeah. nope, you can, you can trust me. You can, you can trust me. No, I'm open and, and not using you. Cause it feels that was the other thing about finding healthy relationships, friendships, family. It doesn't have to be romantic. Finding healthy afterwards goes, oh, is that a red flag? Are you really going to, you're going to use that again? You're going to, no. Oh, wait, you're not. You're going to just love me with it. Oh, okay. Mm. And it's, it's that, but that's what, you know, like you're saying that, uh, yes, my circle can be small and mighty. And really trusted people, because there are. Yeah, the world is not full of completely scary people. There's lots of beautiful people out there that really do love you and really are going to be on your team and be in your corner. Right. Um, yeah. And really, really help you. And like you said, you're just finding the ability to ask for what you need, which is super challenging um, right. yeah, for, for us. <laughs> we were taught, no, your needs don't exist. Oh, yeah. Right. Yeah, that's I'm kind of in that that phase of my personal healing. Like, oh, I have needs. Oh, mm, oh, mm, I'm gonna a- ask it, and no. <laughs> and then what to do with them? And be and and feel like I can ask somebody and not anticipate that they're going to not make it important to them, which is going to hurt me further. Right? Yeah. 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 That's that is, and they're you know, like you said it. You, you said your mom and I was, it, my heart, my, I, I had to cut my mom off. And so a lot of times I'm like, I, I never, but I think that's part of my healing is recognizing I've always, I've always been my mom and loving me that from that perspective going, I am the mom to my son that I always wished my mom had been to me. Oh wait, I'm, I'm mom. Oh. And then being able to find other women in my life to, not fulfill that mom role, but to fill, to fulfill that, that, that woman role and, and that community and, 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 oh, okay. So it doesn't have to be mom. Beautiful that you get to have mom. I love that. But that it can be things like that, that just, oh, okay. Nope. You're, you're the human who can say, I love you. It's okay. (laughs) Well, yeah. I mean, I, the other half of the parent equation was really, 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 really bad. But, yeah. you know, I am grateful that, you know, I did have a a maternal mom that did care. Yeah. And, you know, and even in that, like, our parents are a product of their upbringing, and they're making the best choices, that, even if they're destructive, they're yep. making their best choices. And so like, you know, I could, I would have wanted it to have been different where my mom left earlier Mm -hmm. and I wasn't in it as long as I was, you know, but I just have realized that it's a fool's errand to constantly be woulda, coulda, shoulding. And so we just have to say, it just is, Mm -hmm. it just is. And now what do I do? And that's, there's, that's a lot of power to be like, okay, this is, it's my path. And that's what we talk like, why this show? It's like, yeah, that's my path. That's what landed me here. But I can't imagine it. I can't imagine a better me because that's part of me. Like, yeah. yeah okay. So I, like I said, I, I, I've started seeing, oh, I'm actually a really, really good mom and letting that echo to me and, and be there for my son, even though I didn't have it, I didn't have to have it to be it. And I think that's, hugely healing. And again, that forgiveness piece of going, Hey, your best was terrible, but it was your best. And I actually feel very humanly compassionate towards my parents to go, 
wow, I don't know what your childhood was like because you never shared that with me, but it must have been probably about as bad as mine because Mm -hmm. that's how you showed up. And so that compassionate piece that gets to show up Mm -hmm. um, in the end. uh, Yeah. I think it's, it's hugely beneficial to us in our current selves to just, like you said, just let that be and not necessarily be like, we try and we do. I mean, I've been at that and you probably were at a stage two where you're like, oh, I just wanted that to be different. But I think that's part of that healing process. Right. Yeah. To walk through it that way. Um, but so what are some things that you're looking forward to? This is, you know, you're healing and you're whole and you're happy and you're in this new mm-hmm. venture. And so <laughs> what's uh, what's something bright and new that you're looking forward to on the, the, the horizons that are out there um, as you move forward? So I am um, in this phase of my um, my healing and my, you know, remaking, if you will, and the fulfilling the dreams for myself. Finally, um, I'm really pressing into sharing my experience and um, and showing up messy. And so I'm putting out a more, um, we never tell everybody everything, but just being able to share more of my story and, you know, failures and lessons and what I would do different with the community that I'm serving and, um, doing that through content. And I'm working on launching a, um, a YouTube channel. And um, I'm building resources for the community, the startup founders. And I just, going back to what I said originally, is I just see there being such a a huge need with where we are with our economy and, you know, people that are um, moving around with jobs or job loss and trying to figure out, you know, what do I do next and um, helping people to recognize that they can um, dream their dream and go do it, helping them to fulfill their dream and giving them tools to do it, you know, without a big budget, without having a team and, um, you know, giving them a framework that they can use to go do that. And, um, and it's really satisfying to, um, come alongside folks and help them to succeed. Yeah. Yeah. That is, that's such a beautiful thing about, I think those of us who've walked a path that wasn't necessarily, you know, wasn't shiny and rosy, but we love when other people succeed. Like just, it, it's just so fulfilling to be like, and not necessarily in an ego way of like, Ooh, I did that. It's more like, yeah, look at you go. Like just watching that unfold. And uh, I've been in the entrepreneur space for years and watching someone just really go for it and be like, look Mm -hmm. at you like that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's a beautiful place to be. So Mm -hmm. that's very exciting. Lots of, lots of new and amazing things coming as, as it sounds like you're, you're unfolding this new journey. Um, So as we wrap up our time, I always say this to my guests at the end, if someone is watching or listening and would really love to connect with you, learn more about you, what you do, um, what's a really good way for people to get connected directly with you right now? Yeah, I'd say um, find me on LinkedIn. So Lynn Holland, and um, I'd love to hear, you know, folks' journey. Are they um, contemplating trying to launch something or are they, you know, in the early stages and could use some, you know, encouragement and resources and, you know, how to reach today's buyer, which is very different than they used to be. You know, I'd love to hear from folks. Perfect. So links directly down below as always to get directly connected to Lynn, find her on LinkedIn, send a message and get connected as you will. Lynn, thank you for joining me and sharing a bit of the open and honest and a little bit, as you said, you're messy. Yes. I think it's part of of, of who we are, which is a really authentic way to to just connect with people. So thank you so much for joining me on the show today. Thanks, Megan. Yeah. To the audience who joined us, thank you. As always, I'm wishing you peace, love, and flow. And may your flow be ever rising. Until next time. Thank you.